All right, this is Tyler Baker, pastor here in Jacksonville, Florida, and welcome to the Contend for the Faith podcast. So it is official. That is the title of the podcast. And this would technically be episode four. And uh, this is, I guess you could say, I just thought of this, this would be a surprise guess in the sense that I did not give an announcement video um, about today. But once again, this is going to be very exciting, and in the future, um, don't forget that we have uh, Dr. James White that's going to be coming on here in the next few weeks, and that's been confirmed, and then we also are going to be having on the podcast uh, that is Pastor Chuck Baldwin. But today, I have also an exciting guest, and his name is, uh, do you go by Pastor? Sure, Pastor. Pastor. Yeah, Pastor Brian Ross, and uh, I'm going to let uh, Brother Ross go ahead and introduce himself just so that everybody can be familiar with um, who he is. So, Brother Ross, if you don't mind kind of giving a rundown of who you are and what you do, your resources, and your ministry. Yeah, well, thanks for uh, having me on as a guest. I appreciate being here and you reaching out and inviting me to come on. Um, I'm the pastor of Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've been the pastor there since uh, 2007. I'm the founding pastor of that church. Um, I'm also a high school history and philosophy teacher at a public high school. So I'm a tent making pastor. Um, I just briefly, I mean, education wise, I, I do have a master's degree in history uh, from Norwich University in Vermont. Uh, and I've tried to use that to um, you know in, uh, the skills I learned there for investigating things related to the Bible and church history and those kinds of concepts. So, um, right. yeah, that's a brief rundown. Cool. All righty. So, that yeah, that's going to be a little bit related to today. Now, I didn't know that you taught philosophy, so that's interesting. That is a that is a uh, an interest of mine in particular. Now, we didn't talk about this previously at all, but if you don't mind me drilling down on that a little bit further, what in particular do you teach? Like Western philosophy, just like a basics <clears throat> class, or yeah, it's a high school introduction. So there's like five five big units and um, we don't get, it's, it's not as in depth as it would be at a college level or anything. It's just trying to get the kids to think about um, sort of big topics. So I've got f like four major units. We talk about what is truth, epistemology, um, ethics and morality. Um, we talk about free will versus determination. What right. is a person? And then the last unit, I have a whole unit on, is there a God? And we look at the formal arguments for and against God's existence. Oh, that's cool. Is this a Christian school? No, it's a public school. Oh, that's cool. That's even more interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. so you kind of it sounds like you kind of look at like the different branches of philosophy and then you kind of yeah. narrow things down towards the end of the year. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, well, as I mentioned, the um, the major in history is going to basically uh, be it's going to be very related to the topic today. So, I heard of Brother Ross. I guess it would be it would be wise to begin with kind of an introduction on how I found out about Brian Ross, and that is through a fellow pastor friend. And uh, him and I hold a very King, a very similar King James uh, position. And um, he, we were both in a conversation about just the the famine or the dearth of um, good argumentation um, when it comes to support, supporting uh, the King James Bible, the Texas Receptus, the majority text, and so forth. And um, he had mentioned uh, Brian Ross to me. So the the very next day, I had a little bit of time, and I went and looked up on Kindle. He particularly mentioned a book, and we're going to talk about that book. And um, I researched that book, and I can't remember if it's a pamphlet or a book. I know that I read it in a few hours. I'm assuming it's like a pamphlet. It's a short book. It's about, a, it's about um, you know, 80 pages. It's a little right. longer than a pamphlet, but yeah. it's not a long read. Yeah, yeah. So um, it was, uh, and it it dealt with the topic of Easter in the King James Bible, and uh, this will really be a good introduction, I believe, with the error that many uh, King James uh, proponents make, and um, particularly, there's a lot of sloppy scholarship, and I don't know how blunt you'll be about this, but um, that, that's that's my opinion. There's a there's a lack of intellectualism, and when people go to go to support the King James Bible and to give argumentation for it, I can oftentimes be and find myself somewhat disappointed with. So um, 
Just to give you a little bit of praise, I very much appreciated the scholarly work that was done in your book. I thought it was excellent. I would describe it as being exhaustive. So I knew a lot of the information you presented, but you put it forth in in a very good way. And then there was also quite a few things that I had never heard that was in the book. So it's an exhaustive treatment, I would say, on the topic of, of Easter in the King James Bible. And, and that was one of the main things that I wanted to start out with um uh brother ross so i might as well just kind of jump right into that um and i'll uh here let's do this i'll kind of dovetail this together so if you could uh, share with me your position so before we look at that and i kind of introduce the topic that i want to uh, focus on share with me your position um pastor ross on uh the king james bible and uh and then also if you could kind of give a, a personal testimony real super shortly on uh, very short and quick on how you came to that particular belief uh okay so firstly my position is that i am a king james advocate bible believer I hesitate to say King James only just because of so much negativity that is associated with that term. But as an English speaking person, I exclusively use and read the King James Bible. I believe it's God's word in English for English speaking people. I don't correct it. I don't say a better rendering would be or they messed up on this translation here and it should say this. But I also am uh, keenly aware of the fact that much of the things that have historically and traditionally been said in defense of the King James Bible are just not good arguments um, and and really are, are not only are they, they're factually wrong, they're logically right. bad, um, they're historically inaccurate. And I just got to a point where I, I had to think this thing through for myself. And I came to that through a couple different things happening. Number one, I in 2011, I was involved in some Bible conferences where the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible was being celebrated. And I had been given an assignment at one of these conferences to preach and to teach a seminar on the inerrancy of the King James Bible. Well, around that same time, a gentleman that goes to my church handed me a copy of David Norton's uh, A Textual History of the King James Bible, and he said, read this, and when you're done reading it, let's talk. So I read it, and I encountered some things that were challenging, let's just say, to the traditional King James-only narrative that I had embraced up to that point that were not jiving factually with certain point, certain talking points of that uh, overall narrative, if you will. And so that, that really started to cause me to question, okay, what do I do about this? Uh, and how do I make sense out of, you know, what I'm seeing? And the other thing that happened around that same time that kind of dovetail dovetails with that is I just started realizing that a lot of the sources that I had trusted for information, Gail Ripplinger, people like that, were their arguments were failing as I tested them against right. factual objective evidence. And so I, 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 for a while was really at a sort of, what do I do? I knew at the same time though, that I couldn't go the route of modern versions in the modern critical text because I felt like they right. substantively differ from the traditional text in the King James Bible. And so sorting through all of that is kind of what led me to, you know, where I'm at in my current position. I hope that makes right. sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I had a very similar um, uh, experience. Um, yours has definitely dove much deeper than than mine did, but uh, I had a very similar experience when, when um, I had certain arguments presented to me, and I embraced those arguments for a period of time. And as I grew in my faith, I encountered things here and there, and I attempted my best to be intellectually honest and to have some integrity with the arguments and they shook me but obviously at the exact same time as you said you know i believed the promises of god um, that he would preserve his word and and in fact probably the thing that 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 really disturbed me the most when it came to um some of those positions, and you mentioned Gail Ripplinger and Peter Ruckman, and I appreciate, you know, to be charitable, I appreciate the work that they do in many regards, right? I wouldn't agree with everything, but many respects and many regards, I would appreciate the work that they do for uh, the 
King James Bible. But um, even the promise of God preserving his word to every generation, I found fault with that because they have an issue when they, if you go to uh, uh, point out where the text was prior to the King James Bible, they immediately, there's inconsistencies before the King James Bible. So, um I'm not sure what's going on there. Do you see that in the background? <laughs> yeah, I saw that. You're <laughs> <That's> blowing <crazy>. up. <laughs> I'm probably not going to edit this thing. So uh, that's somebody the must judgment be of God with me. there for uh, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just I, I named Peter Ruckman and, yeah, and Gail right. Ripplinger. Is what it's got to be. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, so I, I realized inconsistencies, and and that didn't sit well with me because I I was trying to be you know reasonable and honest myself. So. Um, I came to some of the same conclusions when it comes to Easter, and that's what I want to get into. And I think that this will kind of give a good sampling to help people to to understand uh, the the what is the 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 correct the uh, um, uh, you know correct accurate historically accurate sound position of you know of the of a proponents of the King James Bible and of the traditional text that we should take and uh, that's really what I do I, I want to be able to put out some information to people and I'm going to reference them to some of your material even more so at the end and so that we can actually have sound answers to some of these things so what I want to look at is Acts. Uh, chapter number 12, verse number 4. And this is going to be, Brother Ross, I don't know what the, you would refer to this or what they refer to it as, but uh, there's a conflict regarding uh, Easter. Is there an official name for this uh, conflict? Um, I'm not aware of one. Um, okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if they had kind of in the theology world uh, or textual criticism world a name for this. Um, but in Acts chapter number 12, verse number 4, in particular in the King James Bible, um, we find the word Easter. And this is the only time that the term Pascha, or Pascha, uh, as it'll be pronounced, is translated uh, as Easter. And there is a, a debate over this. So I'm going to read it real quickly. Acts chapter 12, verse 4 says, And when he had apprehended him... He put him in prison and delivered him to the four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. So we have, as I said, the term Easter, and this is the one and only time that that word is translated um, as Easter. And Brother Ross, I'm going to hand it over to you. If you could kind of give just a little bit more of a backstory to what goes on here and then the response on the King James side. So... The Greek word Pascha is 29 times in the Greek, and only one time it appears as Easter here in the King James in Acts 12.4. And so what happens is uh, the King James only position historically is, you know, they've embraced this idea. I think we'll talk about it here shortly of verbatim. What I've called and what I've settled on is the term is verbatim identicality, right? So in other words, it has to be Easter. It can't be Passover. And so they have to then come up with an explanation for why it's Easter. And so the standard King James only answer for that is that, well, it's Herod. Herod is celebrating the pagan holiday of Easter. And therefore, the King James translation is correct when it has the word Easter here in the verse. Um, that's the Sam Gipp explanation from the answer book. And that's right. like, I've, t I've taught that I've preached that in the past. Yeah. Um, I embraced that when I graduated high school, uh, one of the elders at my dad's church handed me the answer book, uh, as I went away to college and I read it and I, I, man, that made sense to me, right? It, that's the explanation. So it wasn't until I started, um, thinking about that a little bit more critically that I'm like, is this right? Um, and so then I, I don't know how deep you want me to go, but I then started investigating the word Easter and, you know, what exactly is going on. And what I realized is that the word Easter was the English word to refer to the word to refer to Passover, the Jewish holiday before Tyndall even coined the word Passover in 1530 right. when he was working on the Pentateuch. So like the the the, the main King James only defense never even like went back and looked at any of this stuff. And then it just sort of got picked up and then passed on and never really, in my opinion, critically evaluated. 
Okay, yeah. So let me ask you this then: where did the where did the idea originate that uh, uh, the term Easter referred to a pagan holiday? Because you just a moment ago alluded to, or I guess said directly, um, that that term Easter is not a reference to the pagan holiday. Where where did so, it, where did that idea come from? I think it came from the influence of Alexander Hislop's book, The Two Babylons. And in fact, if you read Sam Gipps' The Answer book, he even references Hislop. Um, and so there's this false etymology that's developed around the word Easter. Easter phonetically sounds like Ishtar, fa- sounds like Astarte, so therefore that's what it right, is. Right. And, yeah. and there was never any critical evaluation of whether or not that was true or not. Right. Okay. And then, um, so I, I read the book. I saw the charts. I saw much of the material. I don't know if you're if you're capable of sharing that with us right now or not. You could at least just address it and touch on it, and then uh, we can, of course, reference your book as well. But um, how can you prove the etymology, right, the evolution of that term over time, and where the word Easter actually came from? So your book was what i would say is conclusive on this topic i think it's one of those it's one of those issues that when somebody takes a a a dive into this and looks at it i think the information was presented clear enough that it it is conclusive it's really one of those uh times where there's no stone left unturned so if you could if you could share that in particular can you see that i'm i'm uh okay here you go i'm going to add it to stage and then let's do this all right cool all right so um, this is the table. So I went all the way back to the West Saxon Gospels of 990 and 1175. And you can see here that every time the word Pascha occurs in the text, that they were using some form of Easter to render that word into um, Anglo-Saxon. So the word Easter is associated with the Jewish Passover for like hundreds of years, like in the case of the West Saxon Gospels, over 500 years nearly right. before before Tyndall even terms the, or coins the word Passover. So then if you look at Wycliffe's Bible here, he just transliterates it out of Latin into, Eng, into Middle English as Pasch every time. And then here's where it gets interesting with Luther, because Luther's translating from Greek, and he translates it every time as a form of Ostern or Easter in German. So Luther obviously does not think this is a pagan word. He's right. he's using this word. And then when we get to Tyndall's New Testament here, we can see, I got data here, uh, Tyndall used Paschal or Paschal uh, lamb three different times uh, and some form of Easter 26 times when he makes his New Testament in 1526. And of course, almost every single one of these is a reference to the Jewish feast. And then Coverdale follows suit here in 1535. The Matthews Bible follows suit. Now, when we get to the Great Bible, we start to see a a transition, okay, uh, where Passover starts to be introduced more often into the text. And by the time we get to the King James Bible, you know, you have um, that transition from using Easter to refer to the Jewish feast has now largely been taken up with the use of the word Passover. So to me, the evidence is extremely objective. And then we could look at other, uh, you know, lexicographical information. We could look at the right. Middle English Dictionary, the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, tons. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> tons of different um, sources. And uh, this translational data to me is the most convincing. You could also look at the Old Testament and you could see here, see Tyndall's 1530 Pentateuch. Notice what he does. When he's working on the Old Testament. So here's what happens. Tyndall encounters the story of the angel of death literally passing over, right? And so he invents the word Passover to capture in English the sense of what the Hebrew is saying. And he does it right there in 1530. And then slowly over time, Passover begins to replace Easter as the preferred English way of referring about the Jewish feast. Right, Brother Ross, just to kind of just um, underscore that and to give clarification. So what you're saying as they look at the chart here, uh, the word Passover prior to Tyndale was not used in any translations, correct? It, did, it didn't even exist. It didn't even exist, right? He invented it. So it, yes. it, it does not appear in any translation prior to Tyndale. He, exi- he invented um, the, the term 
Passover. And Correct. as you described, yeah, he invented it for the purpose of, of um, being a designation for the story of literally passing over, right? And the Correct. Exodus story. And if you look at the chart, what's extremely interesting is that you can see that this is logical and you refer to it as objective evidence. There's a decline in the usage of the term, and it's, and it's a, a slow, like natural just decline that until you get to the point of what do you see? I was, I was looking at the, the Bishop's Bible. It looks like Easter appears how many times in the Bishop's Bible? Is it only so Easter, well? uh, yeah, in the Bishop's, it appears twice. In okay. John eleven fifty five, and then once okay. in Acts twelve four. Yeah, in Acts twelve. Okay, that's where I noticed it. Okay, I see them how they're right there next to one another. And then in the King James Bible, it's used one time. Now you right. you also referred to the lexicographical um, evidence as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and, so, I, so here's some of what I'm talking about. So here's Passover. I hope you can see that. Let's see if I can make that a little bigger. Is that better? Um. So here's Passover as, uh, notice, now uh, now only in Jewish Easter. So if you look at these definitions from the OED, so here's uh, the first definition, Passover, the major Jewish spring festival. Notice right here, 1530, Tyndall Bible. It occurs for the first time in English in 1530 in Tyndall's uh, translation of the Old Testament. Right. And yeah. so, so they, yeah, they give you the etymology of the origin yeah. of the word, right? Correct. This is the Oxford English Dictionary here, right? Yep. Perfect. So I have, um, I have, um, I've seen the arguments that are used from Scripture itself, where uh, they will reference Luke chapter number twenty-two. So what I've heard, I believe, what you referred to it as in your book is the Christian Easter theory. Yes. Is, does that ring a bell? Yeah. And what is that? Do you mind kind of sharing that too? So the the Christian Easter view is is essentially the view that the translators they Easter is after um, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ. It's after the conversion of Saul of Tarsus in Acts twelve, and so it's being used there to refer to. The, the Christian celebration of the resurrection and that the King James translation in some way, shape, manner, or form nails down the use of the English word Easter after 1611 as a reference to the um, Christian feast or the Christian celebration of the resurrection. Um, so I think that's, for me, that's an improvement over the, the old get right. view but I still don't think that that's sufficiently accurate. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. So Luke 22 was one of the verses that that um, I used. Uh, I believe it's ver I think it's Luke 22, 1 and 2. I didn't, to be honest, look it up prior to this. Yeah. But um, so that – they'll and they'll use those as well, kind of like you say. This is a little bit of an overlap, but there's a different um, uh, conclusion at the end, right? In the so, two yeah, positions. The, so they might use similar some of the similar verses that I'm using, but they're coming to a different uh, conclusion. And the, the main proponent of this that I'm aware of is a gentleman out of Australia named Nick Sayers. Nick is a very good defender of the traditional text in the King James Version. Um, he and I do disagree on this one point here about Acts 12.4, but I... I I think Nick's view is hands down better than the traditional gift view. Right, much better. So it's it's essentially, uh, like you said, that it's not referring to the pagan holiday that Herod um, followed or anything of that nature. It's it's translated as Easter here because now we are celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Right, and that's all. Yeah, and that's also the view that is taken by the article on the King James Version Today website. That okay, I okay, so that's pretty cite, good. That I cite and quote um, in my book. My issue right. with that, though, it, the reason why I reject that Christian, uh, the Christian view. I forget what I called it. What did I call it? The Christian. View, I think it's the, just Christian Easter view, or yeah, the let's Christian just call Passover it that, view, something like that. Is if you read Acts twelve four, verse one says, "Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church." And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. So he's he kills James, the brother of John. And then it says in verse 3, And because he saw it pleased the Jews, 
So all of Herod's actions here are designed at pleasing the Jews, right? So he saw that it made the Jews happy that he killed James, the brother of John, because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. So he right. arrests Peter with the goal of trying to please the Jews. And then you have the parenthesis in verse three, then were the days of unleavened bread. To me, that's a clear thumbtack right. of what is going on. And the traditional Gip view says that only the 14th of the month is the Passover and everything following that is the days of unleavened bread. And no verse in the Bible ever combines the Passover and the days of unleavened bread. The problem with that, though, is Ezekiel 45, 21, Matthew 26, 17 and 18 and Luke 22, 1, where like, for example, Luke 22, 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And that's the same author, so that's sensible. Yeah. That right? Yeah. So, I think it's a. Th I think that if Luke is the first treatise addressed to Theophilus, and Acts is the second part of that treatise addressed to Theophilus, the reason unleavened bread is in parentheses is to clue Theophilus, the reader, into the fact that this is when this is happening, and it would be triangulating right. clearly back to Luke twenty two one. That's my opinion. That's the way I see it. Right. Yes. Yeah, so the one of the things that was new to me was um, the passage in Ezekiel. I hadn't seen that. So I had used Luke 22 when I held to the Christian Easter theory, I believe is what you referred to it as. I had used Luke 22 to, to refute the, the Sam Gick get position we'll call it that and um to show that hey this is not you know this is not referring to a pagan holiday and i also use the context you know this is clearly something political he's being just as Pilate was he's being a people pleaser and he he's doing it for their sakes but uh it wouldn't make any sense that it has anything to do with it doesn't fit the context that it has anything to do with a pagan holiday so I would show that, hey, yes, this this time period as a whole can also be referred to as the Passover. And then you pointed out in your book, as I mentioned, that that also happens in the Old Testament, where he refers to yeah. the whole feast in the book of Ezekiel as the Passover, not just that one day, right? So right. the whole time of unleavened bread is used interchangeable there with, with um, Passover and Easter as well, yeah, the idea of Easter, right? Right, right. Yeah, yep. so um, this kind of brings us into what is the error that many King James uh, proponents and uh, King James only, as um, they would say today, the error that many of them hold. And um, it's the, the error of verbatim identicality. And when I called you on the phone, I told you that I really like that phrase because I've been looking for something to kind of coin uh, to, to – to nail down this idea that I have noticed for you know quite some time when it comes to my differing with uh, the King James crowd. Um, so this plays in with that, Th this being translated in a different way. They come to the conclusion this must be a totally different word, and that would have to do with, correct, the, the idea of verbatim identicality. Kind of explain that if you don't mind real quick. So just – just real quick to kind of close the gap there on uh, on Acts twelve four, Acts was translated by a different company than the Gospels. So right. the Gospel company that worked on the Gospels they cleaned up and made it east. They made it Passover every time, and for whatever reason, the the company that worked on the Book of Acts did not see fit to change Easter to Passover in that in that spot. Um, so verbatim identicality. I can't take full credit for that term. Uh, a lawyer friend and pastor friend of mine from Columbus, Ohio, David Reed from Columbus Bible Church, he and I have been working for the better part of a decade on trying to find out, a, figure out a way to explain what it is that we're seeing in this issue. I'm sure maybe you've had it yourself where you like kind of you see something and you know you understand it, but then you have to try to figure out how to translate or bring Absolutely. what you're understanding into into words that people can grasp your concepts that you're that you're after. I first started calling this exact sameness, and that was just not as good of a term as verbatim. It's kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's kind of clumsy a little bit. So the position that we've come to is I, we, my friend Dave and I. We think that the assumption that preservation requires verbatim identicality is the unresolved 
fly on the wall in the entire debate and discussion about text and translation. So what happens is the so, so people assume that preservation has to have xeroxed identicality or, or verbatim identicality. And so what happens then is the modern critical text modern version camp ends up reducing inspiration and infallibility to the non-existent original autographs because right. that's the only way they can account for the lack of verbatim identicality. Now they're not explaining it that way, but that is their main problem that they're trying to solve. And then on the other side of the aisle, the you know traditional King James only side is struggling with the same issue. And so they double down on you know the exact wording in the AV as the only way the text could read or it's wrong. Right. Right. So that's, that and then that sense. runs. Yeah, absolutely. Then that's going to run into all kinds of issues. If in the, you know, if the viewer is kind of thinking this through right now, it's going to run into all kinds of issues when it comes to translation, when it comes to other languages, having the what we would still consider the word of God when it comes to all of the translations prior to, let's say, the King James Bible. I mean, it's going to that's going to give you a hard time to have any real usable practical view of preservation of uh, the preservation of God's word. Agreed. Totally agreed. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, to me, it is the, it is the fundamental problem that is going undiagnosed in the entire debate. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's basically like a, like a, a faulty presupposition or an assumption that both crowds have when they come to the, the conversation. Right. So it's it's yeah. just they both kind of assume this. And then when they start to do their work later and to work through some of the scriptures, they just, you know, commit all kinds of errors because they started wrong. So my position is preservation does not require verbatim identicality of wording. What it requires is um, verbal equivalence. Right. Right. Now, that's not dynamic equivalence. That's right. verbal equivalence. So, for example, I could say. I'm gonna. I went to the store at six thirty, or I could say I went to the store at half past six. Right. There's not verbatim identicality, but there's verbal equivalence in what's being said, and so right. that and therefore <laughs> that ex, that excludes in my mind when modern versions of the critical text leave the entire ending of Mark off. Right. Or, you know, the woman taken in adultery or you right. know, any number of other things. The yeah. fundamental problem I have is they're not verbally equivalent because they're right. substantively altering the content of the text. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. They're changing the, the true spirit or thought of what was communicated right in, in the text itself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, with that, let's. Here, let me let me let me look here. I had a couple of questions, and they're, they're going to play into this idea. So this might get people um, uh, a little bit upset. But let me ask you this question, and how I you know might have to be careful how how you you respond to it. So with that that idea, um, with the the King James Bible, um, you you find that that you you believe that the King James Bible is the preserved Word of God in English, right? And you would say as much as that it is it is God's Word. It's pure. It's without error. I'm sure, correct? But obviously with different understandings of what many people would have when it comes to um, what you refer to it as verbal equivalence. Yeah. Like, I don't think there's any errors in the King James Bible. I don't think there's any mistakes. I don't think it reports any information about God, his character, his nature, his dispensational dealings with mankind, archaeology, science, or anything that is false. Right. It's pure despite not being preserved in a state of verbatim identicality. Right, right. So, yeah. So with that, let me ask you this question. What is your position when it comes to a new translation? So I answered this question on a different channel last winter and got in trouble. Uh -oh. um, well, I so, didn't know that. No, that's fine. I um, Here's my position, okay? I do not. I, I I will never go the route of a modern tra modern version. Right. Um, they substantively differ from the text. Okay. Now, hear what I'm saying carefully. In theory, that doesn't mean I'm calling for it or I think it needs to happen. In theory, could the King James be 
updated. Yes. Is the new King James or the modern English version acceptable to me? No, it's not. Right. They're not because I think they substantively differ from, you know, um, what the King James says. But if I'm being honest and consistent, I have to acknowledge that the 1769 edition of the text that I read from and study from and preach from is right. not identical to the 1611 that came off the press. And there are differences in it that are greater than simply updating of spelling and punctuation. Right. There let are me, let, editorial things that have been done. Yeah, let me let me make a little bit of a disclaimer on my of my own. A moment ago I used the, the phrase um it's not it's not the same spirit or thought, but just to clarify that a little bit, I like I'm going to adopt uh, the substantive uh, term that you just used, right? So I think that that that's what that's what I would essentially agree with that they so the other versions are substantive differences, right? When they yes. when they do not use verbal equivalences and when they uh, when they will uh, render it as a totally different word, or if they're reading if it's coming from a different text, a critical text, um, it will come out as not being a, a verbal equivalence in English, you know, in that case. Yeah, so, yeah, um, obviously, and this kind of plays into the same issue that people have in um, when it comes to the King James Bible and and the versions prior to it, right? So all of the, all of the promises of preservation, they don't just, they don't just promise to preserve it to, you know, 21st century uh, English speakers. Obviously, the promises are preserved to, that God would preserve his word to all generations. So the, 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 the question has to be answered, where was God's word prior to the King James Bible? And it it was there. If you believe those promises, you can't just use them, uh, you know, simply or merely for the King James Bible. So you would have to have versions that came before um, the King James Bible that were also um, the the that were also God's word. Let me ask you this: I'm curious about this. So some of these you may not have been prepared for, and I wasn't even. They're they're just uh, sparking in my mind now. So, Brother Ross, um, what do you think about the Latin and the Greek? Particularly, obviously, I would know, you know, in part the Greek, but so I so the um, well, first of all, I have no problem with um, you know Greek. I think I think the preserved Greek is part of the promise of preservation. Um, that you know that's that's a big part of it, and I also think for me there are three hallmarks of preservation. The, the Word of God, it seems to me, teaches me to, to embrace a view of preservation that has the following three points. Number one, it has to be testified in a multiplicity of witnesses that are substantively equivalent, even if they're not verbatimly identical. That's number one. So that excludes for me the critical text. OK, um, because, number two, it had to be available to the body of Christ to use. Uh, number three, it had to be in use. It had to be used by the body of Christ. So if it's not if it's not testified in a multiplicity of copies, it wasn't available and it wasn't in use. Then to me, it it fails to meet the biblical criteria for preservation. And so when you take those criteria and you go look at history and you go look at what's what's out there, and you believe in the promise of preservation as a fundamental biblical promise, it points in the direction of the. Byzantine text type in Greek, in printed form, the received text, which also I am not adverse to saying that the Latin is important in this, because there are readings in a King James Bible and in the in the uh, TR the Textus Receptus that are from the Latin, and that. So this this this, this dichotomy you've seen these two streams of Bibles charts probably. <clears throat> Uh, in defense of the King James, and they always pit the old Latin against the Latin Vulgate, and the Latin Vulgate, you know, is evil and this and that. I, I challenge anybody, go look at a, a Douay Reims New Testament. Get one of those memes from the internet that has a list of all of the verses that are missing from a King James or from a modern version, an NIV or what have you, and look up those verses in the Reims, and you will see that the Reims is in better textual shape than the NIV. Can you share some of the differences with the 1611 compared to the 1769? So I have, you I have can, that? I mean, there's, I'll give you one that's easy. Okay. It's Jude verse 25. 
So I'm reading from a 1769 right here. I have it open in front of me, and it says, To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. The word both is not in the 1611. Okay? It's not immediately clear, but it was in the 1602 bishops that the King James Bible uh, translators were revising. So if, if I'm going to now say, and this is one of the verses that really got me on verbatim identicality, the, the premise that I had been thinking traditionally was, well, every single word has to be identical until I realized that that was forcing me into having to declare which edition of the King James was the inerrant one, logically. And I'm like, this is insane. Why would I ever adopt this position? Because the verse is the same substantively, whether you have the word both in it or not. Right. So that's one example that I could give you off the top of my head. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And there's a lot of those. And obviously there's quite a few of them. I began reading. I can't remember exactly what the name of the book was, but it had something to do with um, the King James Bible in America. You you authored another book. Yeah, that's my book too. Okay, yeah, I, I began that. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. I started to read part of that after I'd finished the book on Easter. And what's the name of the Easter book? One more time. Don't don't pass it's, over uh, Easter. Is that what it don't is? Don't pass. Yeah, don't pass over Easter. A new defense of yeah. Easter in Acts twelve four. Right. Okay. And uh, so, I, so I, I read that, and then I, I looked a couple of days later. I started looking at parts of the, um, of the book, uh, King James Bible in America. What was the name of that one? More time. Is that it. Yeah, the, the King James Bible in America, an orthographic historical and textual investigation. Right. Yeah. So um, in that, I believe, is where I found some of the some of the citations of the differences between the 1611 and the 1769. And you made the same point in the book that they aren't substantive, right, which, again, forces people to take the position um, that wouldn't be the position of verbatim identicality, but verbal uh, equivalence. Um, uh, another thing that would just internally, as a Bible believer, that would push someone to that position, that also kind of pushed me to that position, are the quotations from the Old Testament to the New Testament. We can even see the spirit of the author um, when it comes to um, these quotations in that the word believe will be um, used synonymously or interchangeable with trust. And um, and I don't know your position on this, but I've taught many times that uh, the word charity is is essentially, that is, verbal a verbal equivalence with love. And there's actually a quotation that I've used. I don't know your position on that, but um, in the New Testament, I, might, I, don't, I don't know if I'm getting you in more trouble now or if you would disagree no, with that. Well, uh, no, I've taught on this issue. Um, yeah. I, I Charity, um, Tyndall and everybody through, even to the first edition of the Bishop's Bible in 1568, they said love. It wasn't until the second edition of the Bishop's Bible, and I've studied this, in 1572, the Bishop's Bible was revised, and all of the places where it reached charity in the AV or in the King James were revised by the Anglican bishops in 15, 1572 to change to charity. So the King James translators inherited a text that already had charity in those however many spots. I can't recall right. off the top of my head. And they just elected to leave it the way it is. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a loose quotation at one point, and I'm not sure if you're aware of this. You, you, you probably are. But there's a, obviously the passage in uh, the New Testament where it, uh, Peter writes and says, charity covereth a multitude of sins, right? It's a, that's a loose quotation from Proverbs. Right. Where it's, where, yeah, yeah, love, so you do carry. know. It's, yep. 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 Yeah, love covereth many sins, I think it says. In so the charity, charity yeah, and so, love accomplish the same thing. They do the exact same thing. You can see uh, within the nature of what it is, you know, and, and and plus also Peter pulling from that as a, as a loose quotation um, clearly shows that it's synonymous. It's like how we see the the, the term Jehovah uh, that that name being quoted in Greek as Kyrios. We can then determine that hey, what the meaning of Jehovah is is Lord. So therefore, the King James Bible translators in the Old Testament, when they rendered Jehovah from Hebrew to English as Lord, that was correct. It's the same kind of reasoning in the rendering, and you can see hey, this is an accurate translation from Old Testament to New Testament. Then, so the, what I'm getting at is, I came to this conclusion. Um, uh, 
from being a Bible believer, from seeing that the Bible itself teaches the idea of what you're calling verbal equivalence, right? And so, um, yeah, I, I think there's um, four four points that prove that the Bible does not require verbatim identicality of wording. How the Old Testament quotes the Old Testament, because the Old Testament quotes itself and doesn't do so with verbatim identicality. Right. How the New Testament quotes how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. How the New Testament quotes the New mm-hmm. Testament, and then there's a comparison. And I'm gonna I'm gonna forget the chapters. There's a comparison uh, between. Um, let me see if I can find it quick. Between Jeremiah. There's a passage in Kings and a passage in the Proverbs uh, in the Prophets that's like exactly the same except for like a few words that are changed. Right. Yeah. So the Bib- the Bible itself if you pay attention will teach you how to think about right. the second the secondary issues of how to view preservation. That's my position. If I could put it this way, so I believe in preservation because the Bible teaches me to believe in preservation. Right. So then when I encounter the secondary challenge of oh my there's not verbatim identicality of wording what i need to do then is i need to go back to the bible that taught me to believe in preservation in the first place and say how does the bible teach me to now view the secondary issue of how the preservation occurred that's my position Yeah, ac- yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I totally agree with that. I kind of I, I had a very similar journey uh, that you had, but you definitely spent a lot more time digging and um, and and uh, I appreciate uh, much of the work that you've done. And also, as I mentioned, I appreciate the spirit and the character that you have approached many of these debates and these issues with. I, um, I saw that you had some conversations with Mark Ward and I saw that yep. he appreciated um, the spirit spirit and character, then that's how we're to behave with people across the aisle, um, uh, many other people. We're going to differ with people that um, you know are Christian, but we have different views on all different types, all different manner of issues. So I appreciated that. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on. I know we're probably winding down here, but if people want to know more about um, the view that I have, I have... 223 lessons in a class I'm teaching in the adult Sunday school hour called from this generation forever, where we started at square one with inspiration. And now we've built it all the way out into really digging into what did the King James translators do? What were the circumstances that precipitated the King James Bible? How did they do their work? How was it received when it was first published? A lot of, lot of work there if people are interested uh, in, in that. And I'd also say my colleague, Dave Reed, and I, we have a book coming out hopefully in this spring of 2024 titled, How Did God Really Preserve His Word? And it's an investigation into verbatim identicality and um, verbal equivalence. The philosophy of the King James Bible translators is given in the epistle to the reader. And I think that that's important. You mind touching on that real quick, real briefly, and then we'll shut this thing down? So they explicitly say that they were not using, to use their words, a uniformity of phrasing or an identity of words. So they tell the reader that they had no problem taking one Greek word and rendering with two, three, four English words that were equivalent in meaning that, yeah. to, to that one Greek word. They say they did that. They knew that there would be people that disparaged the project, and yet they decided to do that anyway. Um, it's fascinating um, to, to learn you know, what their opinion was about that issue. Right. Uh, so uh, that's important to kind of hitch that up with what we were talking about earlier. The Bible right. teaches you how to think, right, and how to think about preservation. And uh, the it's not a coincidence that the translators whom, whom God used here had that exact philosophy or way of thinking when they approached uh, translation. They had a, they had a biblical uh, philosophy or mentality when it came to their way of translation and the idea of how uh, God's Word, uh, in that sense, was preserved. That's a really important point that uh, yeah, you know, lot, maybe sure. a lot of people probably aren't aware of. Yeah, so um, I think those are good terms that people need to carry with them, and 
this is an issue that I hope that I can kind of spark some people's minds and they can uh, look into a little bit further. Um, but uh, I, I think a good place to 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 uh, uh, end all of this is just um, uh, kind of pushing people to look at maybe a couple of those books. You said your book is uh, "Don't Pass Over Easter," and per- Don't that pass was the over one. Easter. Yeah, so that's, I believe, a really powerful book. And for people to, that is King James Bible believers to get away from the the terrible defense uh, that Sam Gipp and many people put forward. Uh, the other book was uh, King James, the King James Bible in America. King James Bible in America. I also have a little booklet on preservation in Psalm 12, 6, and 7. Um, and then I've got a book coming out this spring again about verbatim identicality. Cool, and I know you referenced your YouTube channel. I don't know, did you give your name? Of the, the that is the yeah, name the, of the YouTube channel. It's it's just Grace Life Bible. Grace Life Bible. Yep. Cool. All righty, man. I am honored to have you on. I appreciate thanks. your time. Yes, sir. God bless you, brother Brian. Yeah. Thanks for having me on.